So because um, audience vary and knowledge base, we're going to kind of start with a system selection and setup um, overview. And this is kind of more big picture. It's going to introduce you to some equipment you're probably already familiar with, but some people enter the room with no knowledge and some people enter the room with different kinds of knowledge. Um, so we are going to cover some, some information that you may already know. And then we're going to think about considerations for taking systems and then designing them and laying them out for, for farms for commercial purposes. So what I'm going to kind of touch on is commercially available incubation tanks, larval and fingerling rearing tanks, um, how do those are assembled, uh, what the water source options are, considerations for sizing systems, monitoring and water quality, and then design and flow of a farm and the systems within the farm. So what I won't be covering is, I won't be covering an in-depth explanation for recirculating aquaculture systems or the functions of their component parts, because we're going to be hearing about that throughout the morning from other speakers. Um, the purpose of this talk really is to just kind of introduce possibilities and to start getting us thinking about how systems can be set up um, with things that are available and things that we can create for different species at different life stages for different facilities, because those needs vary depending on your facility, your purpose, and your species. Um, so we're going to start with just some basic commercial available incubation units. So one of the most industry accepted um, incubation systems is a conical shape jar. So these are known as, known as McDonald jars. The idea is water is introduced from the top, but then it actually um, upwells from the bottom and that gently rolls fish eggs. Um, there is a screening device to be able to hold those fish eggs in. Um, those can be put into systems in series, um, and they're just really great for having eggs in a small volume of water and being able to administer treatment that is really cost effective. Um, I'm kind of covering multiple different things. Some we will not use for the species, but just knowing what they're out there and knowing why they're not good for specific species. So another option are trays. Um, this example are vertical incubation trays. So unlike water upwelling from the bottom and gently rolling eggs, the water is introduced from the top and that cascades down through. Um, the great thing about these are is that you can put a lot of eggs in a very complex space. So if, you're, if your space is an issue, these work really well. So these are the industry standards for salmon. They're typically used for salmon and trout. They are not commonly used for largemouth bass, yellow perch, and walleye. And I can say from experience, I would never recommend these for yellow perch. Um, so when we're thinking about an egg that is adhesive, so a largemouth bass egg is adhesive. And so spawning mounts are really um, common for putting in either ponds or tanks. And that creates a, a substrate that simulates the natural environment, whether it be rock or vegetation. The fish will then spawn on those mats and the eggs adhere to it. So the nice thing about those is that those can be lifted out of the water. They can even be hung vertically and sprayed down to remove any debris. And then those can be transferred either into another pond unit where there's only small fish of the same age and so there won't be predation within that system or to an indoor tank. And these can be used for, like I said, indoor and outdoor units. So moving on to larval rearing, when we're starting with egg, then once those eggs hatch, what are we gonna do with them? You know, are we gonna hatch those eggs in a tank and leave them in there for first feedings? Or are we gonna use this really compact system to be able to hatch the eggs and then am I gonna transfer them into another unit? So larval rearing tanks are typically circular in shape. Um, they're typically small. They typically run somewhere between 60 and 1,000 liters. Their depth may vary depending on your need and your species. Um, and then the materials that they're made out of too. Um, the idea when selecting larval rearing tanks is a lot of times it's management um, and how you're gonna manage the feeding of those larval fish at that specific stage. 
Now, fingerling tanks are pretty much the same thing, but a little bit bigger. The only difference is in a larval tank, sometimes people will use a conical shaped bottom to kind of create an upwelling environment to, to create a current that raises, that starts at the bottom and goes to the top. Um, but in a fingerling marine tank, cleaning is going to become a big issue. So you want to have a, a surface that is easily cleanable and the debris can be collected out of. Um, they typically are bigger um, because you need more space for the biomass of the fish as they grow. So just thinking about those different units. So when we're in a hatchery or when we're in the juvenile system, you know, we can have a we can put our fish in through multiple containers for multiple phases, and then we can connect them and flow water through in different ways. So I would say typically most hatcheries are ran off of flow through systems, but recirculating systems can be used um, and semi-recirculating systems. So with a recirculating system, that really means that you're going to be reusing and recirculating at least 90% of your water. So considerations with that is the tighter we run a system and the more we recirculate water, the more that we might build up waste and that can even build up in larval and, and um, catching systems, and then we also need to think about water temperature and how we're going to manage that. So where my water comes from is a big consideration because you need to know if you need to treat it before it enters your system, you need to know potentially what's in it, and you need to know if you need to put in additional technology to be able to um, create water temperature or quality that is optimum for fish. And water is the first consideration. It's a consideration when you're making your site selection because you want to have an adequate, an abundant amount of water. Um, and you want to make sure that that water is not toxic or you won't have to put in a lot of infrastructure to be able to make that water usable for the species that you're working with. So one option is municipal water. Um, the disadvantage or advantage of municipal water is it's pre there's commonly chemical treatments used to um, kill any sort of pathogens that are in it and other things. And that can be in the form of like chlorine or chlorine and that kills fish. So you have to have a way that that can be removed before it enters the system, which can be simple with using um, like a passive kind of degassing and setting, or you can use a chemical neutralizer. Um, what the temperature that your water comes in the building is going to determine if you're going to need to heat that or if you're going to need to cool it. And if you're using municipal water for a, a cold or cool water species that needs to go through a wintering period, you're going to have to think about putting in chillers to be able to make that water cool enough. So another option is well water. Um, well water can be very abundant, um, but it does tend to uh, contain minerals. So in Indiana and Illinois, we have a lot of iron in our water. And so you have to put in some sort of typically, you have to think about the mechanical or the filtration that will be at the beginning of your water source before it enters your tank. Um, and because well waters can be so abundant in the water source, it is not uncommon to see um, well water source used for flow through systems um, in yellow perch and walleye, um, but they do require heating and chilling and wells change over time. So it's good to know that the, the flow rate, the yield and the water quality will change over time. So you wanna kind of think about testing that well and making sure your, your water source is still out of it. Um, spring water is another option. Um, stories I love to hear about farmers when they're siting is when they go to an area and they start looking at springs and asking the locals what spring had the best flow during a drought condition. So if you're operating off of a spring, you want to make sure that you have a spring that has been reliable and abundant, even when there hasn't been a lot of rainfall. And a really active spring is like gold for a farmer. So it can have all the water you need and you don't have to pay as much. So municipal, you're paying the utility fee. Um, if you have a well, you're paying for pumping uh, and the maintenance of that pump. Well, spring water can, in some cases, be gravity flowed. So it can be a very cost-effective um, water source. So thinking about sizing. So when you're thinking about sizing the system, um, the way I work is I start at the end and I work backwards. Um, because knowing where you want to be will help you figure out how to get there. 
by how many tanks I have to put in, by how large those tanks have to be, and how I'm going to configure those tanks on the farm. And it can help you to think about things like uh, when you're putting in those systems, you know, the cost of purchasing and installation, um, both minimum and maximum stocking densities. So, for example, perch don't do well at low stocking densities. So you're going to want to make sure that the tanks you have them in at each stage is going to, to keep them close enough so that they're going to have good feeding behavior. Um, but also thinking about things like risks associated to intensification. So there's costs and risks associated with how tight we run systems um, and how tense they become on um, intense they become on density. Um, and that is uh, a lot of times thought about if oxygen is my limiting factor, if I lose oxygen, how many minutes do I have to respond to that issue before my fish die? So those are considerations because sometimes it's more cost effective to put in more tanks and kind of have a larger floor plan than to crowd your tank, your fish closer together and try and make it very compact. Um, monitoring is always a important consideration too um, if you're going to be putting in permanent fixtures um, and where those are going to be located. Um, they, are, they need to be easily accessible. Um, will you have handheld or water testing? Where will that happen? Will it be close to the system so you save time on labor? Um, and just because you have a, an egg in a hatching unit doesn't mean you might not have water quality issues. So eggs, if they degrade, they do release ammonia. And so you can kill eggs by putting them in a recirculating system and not making sure they have enough makeup water um, because they could get a high spike in ammonia. Um, so thinking about that flow and thinking about sizing systems based on where I want to be and where I'm starting. Um, it's also good to think about that as an almost like an operational flow plan. So where are fish going to enter my farm? You know, how am I going to put biosecurity so that I don't introduce a disease onto my farm? Um, how am I going to move fish from one tank to another? And so as presenters present, you'll see um, sometimes how a fish is grown for a very small period of time and then it needs to be moved into another unit. So am I going to be able to build in a system where I can passively move those fish from one place to the other, decreasing stress? Or am I going to be netting and manually moving them? And if I'm going to be manually moving them, the question to um, how we're going to operate them, how we're going to flow water through them. Um, so you have, there are multiple options for fish at different stages, depending on what kind of fish, what their critical characteristics and needs are. Um, Species at different life stages um, have different needs. And so the way that you customize that system for that need at that time is going to really depend on what your system is. And so as you see systems um, from presenters throughout the day, you're going to see how they have taken a basic tank with water flowing in and water flowing out and a standpipe to, to keep the water level level. And you're going to see how they add things to the system to be able to maximize production for that species at that time. Um, and then just when one more touch just on when you're designing that system, keeping in mind the size of the units, um, developing that, sec that successful biological plan, um, and then being able to reduce stress and building in efficiencies because labor is going to be one of your biggest costs. And if you can build in efficiencies, that could cost you on, save you on the cost of labor.